All right, let's go ahead and get started with our toolbox. This is the core class for the visual arts track and we're really glad that you all are with us. And I'll uh, keep watching that waiting room and admitting others as they as they arrive. But I want to be respectful of your time and also of our guest today. I want to introduce him to you. This is a dear friend of Animates and the centers and mine. Some of you who've been on campus have probably had classes with uh, Professor Corey before. This is Joe Corey. Joe is an artist and a teacher who's also passionate about using art to figure out this complex world and to point others to Jesus. After spending 35 years in the Midwest and earning degrees from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and the University of Chicago, Joe and his family loaded up their minivan and they drove south, moving to where he now spends his days working at Sanford University in the studio also leading the board of SEVA, the Christians in the Visual Arts National Organization, which is dedicated to supporting faith-based artists and the church. Joe enjoys mentoring young artists and helping them discover where their faith and calling converge. An introvert by nature, when he's not working, he enjoys reading, watching sports, serving as an elder at his church, or hanging out with his very patient wife and therefore Awesome children. Can I add some adjectives there, Joe? You can learn more about Joe and his work at joecorey.com. Joe's joining us from his office uh, in the art lofts here at Sanford University, and we're so appreciative of your willingness to share this time with us, Joe. And uh, with that, I don't want to monopolize any more of this time. I'm going to hand it off to you, and we'll look forward to hearing from you in the session, The Role of Visual Arts in Worship. Yeah, thanks, uh, Tracy. Hey, everybody. Hope you're having a good time here at Animate Flex. I'm going to share my screen. And I'm going to go through my presentation. And if you guys have any um, questions or anything, please drop them into the chat. I'm happy to stop and answer those as we go. And uh, hopefully we'll have time at the end. So this is um, the visual arts track session one. I hope you can come back tomorrow and then also on Wednesday to, to have the other, or to view or participate in the other two sessions. Uh, today, I'm gonna to talk about the role of visual arts in worship. Um, this is me, I'm, I'm your instructor, like Tracy said, I'm a professor here at Sanford. I've been here since 2014. Um, I'm originally from Iowa and I lived in Chicago for 13 years. Um, and I'm also, like she said, the father of four awesome kids, two of whom are teenagers. And so every day, day in and day out, I'm dealing and interacting with teens. And so it's just, it's been a huge blessing um, to, to not only work with my own kids, but also at Animate. I think this is my fourth time teaching at Animate. And so I'm, I'm pretty excited about that. Uh, one of the things I wanted to point out is as I go through my slideshow, you'll see lots of images uh, like this one here on the right. And uh, if it just says the title with the, with the stuff uh, that's that's made from, then that is mine. And so this is a piece I did last year called Rest from Anxiety for our Animate 2020. And you'll see different ones um, throughout, the, throughout the presentation. Uh, to, in today's session, we're gonna do a few things. Um, first, we're gonna learn what the Bible says about creation and the arts and how churches have used the arts throughout history. So we're gonna spend a lot of time just digging deep into that and giving you a, guys an idea of why the arts are important, specifically fine art. Um, and what the Bible says about that, and then also how churches have used art. Uh, we're going to see some examples of faithful artists who are honoring their gifts with their arts. And so I don't want to just talk about this. I want to show you guys some examples of other artists who are both working inside and outside of the church and what they're doing. And then we're going to spend some time throughout at different points. Um, I call them two minute pauses. I'm going to pause and have you guys uh, spend some time just reflecting on how God might be calling you to use your gifts as an artist. And then finally, um, you're going to engage after the session, I'm going to uh, challenge slash invite you guys to create a work of art on your own to add to our gallery of joy, which we're super excited about this year. Um, so things that you're going to need for this session, uh, hopefully you have a Bible with you, either with you or on your phone. Um, because we're doing this virtually, I won't have you look stuff up and say it, the verses back to me. I can provide that for you. But you, wanna, you might want to mark it in your Bible just to kind of note it. And so it's, it'll be good to have on hand. Uh, a journal, something or something to write on, a piece of paper, 
whatever, uh, a pencil or a pen or marker or something you write with. And then art supplies, uh, again, to make something after the session, that, again, hopefully you can contribute to the gallery of joy. Um, anything will do, you don't need to go out and buy anything fancy, paper, pencils, pens, paints, markers, anything you might have on hand, um, even your phone camera, you know, to take a photograph or something. Uh, my kids love just using printer paper and color pencils and markers, and they make all kinds of um, stuff with that. And so again, we, we don't, you don't have to be fancy. I'm not going to ask you to go out and buy a bunch of supplies. Um, you know, grab what you have on hand. And really what we want to, you know, what I'm going to invite you to do is just give a response, um, a creative response in whatever way you feel is appropriate to do that. Um, as we kind of kick off, I wanted to set the context for today um, just by talking a little bit about visual culture, this idea of visual culture. Um, I know as teenagers, you guys have spent most of your life in the midst of uh, iPhones and, and Instagram. So the iPhone launched in 2007, uh, Instagram launched in 2010. But if you, you know, like what my kids would say is in the olden days, right? In the olden days, when I was a kid, um, the iPhone wasn't around, Instagram wasn't around, and a lot of people weren't very familiar with visual culture. But that has changed a lot. Um, specifically because of smartphone technology and apps like Instagram and TikTok and things like that. And they've been, those, both the, the software and the hardware has been really influential on how people use and respond to visual culture. Um, and so you might have heard this term, um, this one drives my students nuts, but it's everyone is a photographer. And it's this idea that because I have my phone with me and I have the ability to take a photograph, I can also be a photographer. Um, and what I, I really, it's a love hate thing as an artist and as someone who does photography, I realize it's more complex than that. Um, but what that points to is this kind of increase in our culture of visual literacy. And so down on the right, you'll see I put the definition of, of visual literacy. And so visual literacy is the ability to interpret, to negotiate and to make meaning from information presented in the form of an image. And we live in a culture where images are everywhere. I think the statistic is, is, is as, um, as Americans, we engage with like four or 5,000 advertisements a day, okay? Um, and many of those advertisements are uh, uh, use images or visual means. And so um, again, we're bombarded with images in our just kind of our everyday life. And a result of that and of being bombarded with those images is that we live in a culture that really embraces imagery as a form of communication. And so we know how to communicate through images. Well, when you think about that idea of communicating through images or imagery, um, one of the big important things in order to do that is we have to have the ability to see an image and to decode it. Um, and so we have to be able to look at, for example, a smiley face and know that that, that means um, or is trying to communicate happiness or goodwill or something like that. Um, and this is very, very new in our history, actually. Um, we haven't always, again, we haven't always lived in a culture like that. And so I always like to kind of point that out because it's really important when thinking about this idea of the arts in worship or in the church kind of context. As artists, we use images to communicate. Um, we don't use music and song. We don't uh, use writing or sermons. We use imagery. And so those images are communicating the ideas uh, that we're trying to get across. And the really cool thing about living in the time that we live is most people have the ability to look at images and have the ability to decode those images and understand what they mean without a whole lot of um, prompting or explanation. And so just I wanted you I wanted to say that just so you guys could kind of um, keep that in the back of your mind as we kind of go through and talk about, uh, you know, the role of the arts in, in worship today, just to get a sense of or an understanding that um, again, we live in a time where people are very, very comfortable with visual imagery and um, their ability to, to decode that. Okay, so I'm going to take our first two minute pause right off the bat. Uh, and the way this is going to work is um, I have in most of these, I have three parts. There's an engage part. I'm going to ask you to do something. And then part of that engaging is I want you to reflect, take a moment to reflect. And then when I call us back together in, a, in, in two minutes, we're going to pray. And I, I've written out some short 
uh, prayers here. And so for this first one, what I want you to do is I want you to write down that definition of visual literacy. You don't need to remember it. It's here on the bottom of the screen on the right. And just, I think, again, it's just good to take note of that. And so I'm going to have you write that down. And then after you write that down, um, take a moment and reflect on these, these couple of questions. One, uh, the first is, how have you used visual literacy to interpret and make meaning from an image that you've encountered? And that can be any image, uh, something you saw this morning, it could be an advertisement, I mean, maybe the cereal box, right? Um, what, how, how did you make meaning from that image? Uh, the second one is a really big question. Uh, and again, I just want you to reflect, you don't have to have the right answer. Uh, or an answer actually, because um, these, are, these are really pretty complex questions when you think about it, is, but what do you think is the purpose of art? Um, and so just to take a moment and think about that. And then finally, what do you think the Bible says about creativity and the arts? And that's gonna give us a little bit of a baseline just so you, as we go through, you can look back and say, oh, well, this is what I thought it meant. And maybe this is what I'm learning it means and see if those match up uh, and, and, and are similar or not. And so let's take two minutes. I'll uh, start the clock now. And again, write down the definition of visual literacy, um, reflect on how you've used visual literacy to interpret and make meaning from an image you've encountered. And so you can write the, these reflections down as well. Uh, what do you think the purpose of art is? And what do you think the Bible says about creativity and the arts? And in about a minute and a half, I will call us back together and I'll, we'll, we'll pray together. All right, I'm gonna give you about 30 more seconds. All right, um, that two minutes went fast, but let's, we gotta keep going because we can get through these, but um, let's, let's take a moment and just pray together uh, as we open this session. So dear God, thank you for creating such a vibrant and beautiful world. I invite your spirit to work in me today as I learn more about how I can use my gifts to glorify you, amen. Okay, so that's visual literacy. And again, just keep that kind of in the back of your mind as we keep moving forward. Uh, and so one of the things that I've done in, in terms of helping to structure some of my presentation is I, I want to present some questions to you guys. And again, just because of the format, um, these are kind of rhetorical questions, just things to think about. But one of the big questions that I had um, when I was a teenager, for sure, but even as I got older and through college and had graduated with an art degree and began teaching and began teaching at a Christian college, is I started to ask myself, well, what does the Bible actually say about art and creativity? It, that's one of those things that my pastors did not talk about, I don't think ever or very often. And so I had to begin to really kind of do some exploration. Now, the cool thing is, is there's a lot of people out there who are thinking about this question and who are writing about it. And so if it's a question that you, know, you find interesting and engaging, you can definitely find a lot of resources about it. Um, but I wanna talk about a couple of things in regards to that. First is I wanna remind you guys that the Bible's overall purpose is to reveal God's character to his followers. That's why we have the Bible. That's why we have scripture. It's why we engage in it. And it's why we continue to engage in it is because the Bible and scripture is revealing God's character to us. Now, the cool thing about that is as we engage with scripture and as um, we, we see that kind of who God's character is, what we start to see is, is a couple of things related to the arts that I think really reinforce what some of you may have 
uh, which I'll talk about in, in a few minutes, is which is this notion of a calling to be an artist or to work in the arts. Um, and the first one is, and we see this right away, uh, is that God is the creator of all things. And so even beyond the Genesis story, we see this in John uh, 1, 3. Uh, John 1, 3 says, everything came into being through the word and without the word, nothing came into being. Uh, Colossians 1, 16 and 17, because all things were created by him, both in the heavens and on earth, the things that are visible and the things that are invisible, uh, whether those are thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him. He existed be before all things and all things are held together in him. And that's just a really cool picture of this idea of God existing before even things and pulling all of that and creating it um, out of his own kind of um, out of nothing, actually. Uh, God has the ability to create out of nothing, right? Um, the second thing we see is that God is also, beyond just being the creator of things, he's also the source of beauty. And so, you know, we look at a verse like Psalms 27, 4, I have asked one thing from the Lord, it's all I seek, to live in the Lord's house all the days, seeing the Lord's beauty and constantly adorning his temple. And then Ecclesiastes 3 says, uh, three eleven says, God has made everything fitting in its time but has also placed eternity in their hands without enabling them to discover what God has done from beginning to end. And that idea of God making everything fitting or beautiful, right? It, it's made for a purpose, for, for a specific reason. Um, and so uh, when I found that out and, and realized this and recognized that God is the creator of all things, um, and he's also the source of beauty, it, I began to get really excited because what we also then see is that God invites us to participate in co-creation with him in a limited capacity. Again, we're not God and he doesn't give us the same powers that he has. We can't just create out of nothing, right? Um, but we can take things and rearrange them in a way uh, that is useful, but is also beautiful as well. And so we see this in Genesis 1 and 2. So we see that God exists in a Trinitarian community, so the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and that he has the ability to create out of nothing, and that not only can he create, but he takes delight in what create he creates, right? Um, and so we also learn that God creates us as humans. He created us in his own image, and that as his children, we bear his image or the image of God. And so God gave us uh, tasks to do, right? He gives Adam and Eve tasks and responsibilities to do. Um, in that creation. And those tasks um, are imaginative, uh, they're self-reflective, and they're also relational. And so we have to use our imagination, we have to use our um, critical thinking, and we have to do them within relationship with other things. Um, and so again, creation is a gift um, that God gives to us, and the context for culture making is a responsibility that as humans we have. Uh, the writer Dorothy Sayers, describes it this way. She said, everybody is a maker in the simplest meaning of the term. We spend our lives putting matter together in new patterns and so creating forms which were not there before. Um, and that's whether you're a fine artist who's making a painting, a photographer taking a picture, um, or a cook or a chef making a, a really fantastic meal, a carpenter, you know, making something out of wood. Um, as humans, we make, we create engineers, right? furniture designers. Um, we are creating things that can be used and used in culture. And so that leads up me to another question, and I put the answer here, so it's a little bit of jeopardy in that I flipped it, um, which is, is art necessary? And yes, art is very, very necessary. Um, and a lot of times what you'll hear uh, from people who don't quite understand art or they're sometimes people are afraid of it. They're not really sure what to do with it is they'll kind of use this excuse of like, well, art's not necessary. Right. Um, or they'll or they'll talk about it as being, oh, it's just for entertainment or, or it's a shallow thing. And that's actually really pretty far from the truth. Art is very, very nece necessary and it's necessary um, according to God's plan and to God's will. Um, so again, God, we're made in God's image, and, and because of that, we're invited to join him to accomplish his work in the world. We see that in Genesis 2. And so as artists, we're called by God to address specific human needs, which help to kind of uphold our humanity, all right? And so as artists, we supply fitting design, right? We design things like cars, 
We design smartphones, computers, um, houses. These are, these are things that artists do. They use their artistry to design these things. And these things help humans. Um, we design really cheap and affordable wells that can be put in you know, the desert in Africa so communities can have water, right? Uh, that is something that was designed by an artist. Um, and so design is a really important aspect of being an artist and it's a very kind of crucial thing or a crucial uh, necessity uh, of just human life, human interaction. Uh, as artists, we advance meaningful critique. That means we ask big and difficult questions, right? Um, and when we see things like oppression, for example, as artists, we call that out and we, we make work that responds to that and asks some of these deeper questions. We also ask questions about just the meaning of life. Why are, as humans, why are we here? And so art can be a really powerful tool in helping point students or, um, or other people um, to some of those questions to ask. Um, as artists, we generate beauty. Artists make beautiful things. And there's, I'm not going to get into beauty because that's like a whole other toolbox session, but um, there's a lot to be said for beauty and in terms of just enjoying uh, our world and also just in terms of the harmony that beauty can bring. And then finally, as artists, we explore mystery. And again, that gets back to you know, some of asking those hard questions that we might not know the answer to. Um, there's a lot out there that we don't know. And so as artists, we can explore that mystery. And again, we can use our artistry, I think, to point people towards God in a really, really kind of meaningful and important way. And so art is absolutely necessary. Um, and so if it's necessary to humanity and it's necessary just to our kind of culture and lives, then art is also going to be necessary um, to the church. And so we're going we're gonna to unpack that a little bit and talk about what that means. And so uh, what I wanted to do is I wanted to also dive a little bit deeper into some different biblical examples um, of art as a creative calling. And again, as, as someone who under, appreciates art or maybe you have a passion for art, or you like taking photographs or drawing or whatever. Um, as a little kid, I was constantly coloring and painting and doodling. Um, I used to do this thing when I was a toddler. Uh, and I, I would get spanked for it, though. What I would do is I would take crayons and I would melt them on light bulbs. That's back when light bulbs were hot. Um, and as like, I remember my mom has a picture of me somewhere as like a three-year-old melting crayons because I liked the pretty colors that they made. And, and she said, Joe, why are, you, why are you melting crayons in the light bulbs? And I said, because it's pretty, right? And so again, there's this inerrant kind of uh, calling in me that over, as I grew through my teen years and went to college and then became you know, kind of an adult, I, I realized. And so um, I've been able to kind of, I've been fortunate enough to follow that calling. Um, and so anyway, you might be having that calling too, is God is saying, hey, I've given you these talents, I've given you this ability, and I want you to use them. And so there are examples of this in the Bible as well. And so again, we look back to Genesis, uh, in Genesis 4, 19, uh, we have Jubal, who's the father of all those who play the harp and the flute. So that's our first kind of reference to music. Uh, and then Ju Jubal's brother is a guy named Tublacan, and Tublacan was a forger of every tool of bronze and iron. And so you have music, and next to music, you have his brother, uh, Tubal Khan, who is creating tools, hammers, knives, chisels, these tools that artists will use to then make, you know, all sorts of different things. And so we see this right away in Genesis, we see this creation of musical instruments, and we at the same time, we see this creation of tools, both of whom uh, Jubal and Tubal Khan are Adam's descendants. Uh, if I remember off the top of my head, I think they're like sixth generation descendants from Adam. And so right away, early, very, very early in the biblical story, we see the arts. We see music, we see tools being made. Uh, a second example is an exodus, okay? And so, you know, let's fast forward in time and we have Moses and they've left Egypt and they're out uh, wandering during that 40 years. And so in Exodus 31, uh, the Lord says to Moses, I have chosen Bezalel and I have filled him with the spirit of God, with wisdom and understanding, with knowledge and with all kinds of skills to make artistic design and engage in all kinds of crafts. Moreover, I've appointed and I can never pronounce this one's, uh, this guy's name right, Aholab, Aholab, Aholo, something like that, Aholab, <laughs> to help him. Uh, I have given ability to all the skilled workers to make everything I have commanded. And something, again, I like to point out there is that God, this, like, this notion of making artistic designs, right? Like, this is God filling uh, Bazel with the spirit of God, with his wisdom and understanding and knowledge. And so God is taking that 
that knowledge of creation design and he's giving it to a human being to make an artistic design. So these guys were tasked with making the tabernacle, all right, which is a very kind of important, uh, ornate, very, very decorative thing. And so there's an intentionality there, right? They're not just kind of throwing stuff up. They're not just, you know, making a tent or whatever. Um, there's, there's actual intentionality to that design and that design was God breathed. And so what this helps us to see is that artistry is a gift from God and designed to be used for God's purpose. Okay. And so that, I mean, that brings for me, that brings a lot more weight to this idea of just making, right? Like this is God's gift to me and I'm to use that gift for his purpose. And not only that, he's filling us with his spirit uh, of wisdom and understanding and knowledge to make these things. And so that's a really cool kind of thing, cool kind of concept to think about as well. And then my third example is in Acts, uh, Acts 18, Paul, Paul leaves Athens and he goes to Corinth where he finds a Jew named Aquila. Uh, his wife is also, so it's Aquila and Priscilla. And so Paul goes to them because he, they were in the same trade. Um, they, they were tent makers. And so um, he goes to them and because he was the same trade, he remained with them and worked for they were tent makers by trade. And so what God is asking us to do is asking us to use our skills for the good of the whole community or for the whole of culture. So Paul, um, is a, is a tent maker, right? He works with his hands. He cuts, he sews, he stretches fabric. He has to craft um, the stakes. Uh, and so he's using those kind of manual labor, kind of artistic design skills for the good of the whole community. Um, and not only that, he's using those skills to also be a witness for the gospel. And so we see a really good example here of Paul, someone who's a, a, an artisan, right? Uh, who, does, who does craft work, again, skills with his hand is making things uh, with his partners, Aquila and Priscilla, uh, for the good of the whole community or for the good of culture, and also to be a witness to the gospel. And so those are three examples of where we just see the arts kind of pop up in the Bible, and we see just the importance, again, of uh, this gift from God that he has given us specifically with his wisdom and understanding and knowledge to, to use our to use our skill and ability for the good of the whole community in witness to him. And so when you ask the kind of the bigger question of why does art matter to God, um, this, is, this is some things I think is important to remember. So God uses artists and other skilled workers to reveal his character, okay, um, to accomplish his work, and then to address human needs. And we see that in all three of those examples. God's revealing his character, who he is, uh, he's accomplishing his work here on earth, and he's addressing the, the needs of the humans. And so whether that's part of a church, um, whether you're working inside the church or you're working outside of the church, artists are really, really crucial, and they really matter to the kingdom of God, to this overall notion of um, bringing God's kingdom here to earth. And so I just, I think that's important to point out. Um, again, as a high school student, I really struggled with this. I knew I felt like I had these gifts that God had given me, but I didn't quite understand what to do with them. Nobody in my church really talked about art or understood art. Um, some people were actually kind of um, pretty antagonistic towards art. Um, I think they saw and connected art with kind of worldly things. Um, and so there was a real, I think, misunderstanding uh, of, of art and, and its purpose. And, and so I, these were questions that I really had to wrestle with through high school and college and then even beyond before I, again, just looking back at the word and some other study and looking at other resources, came to really realize that as artists, we play a really, really important role um, in regards to, um, to God's kingdom. And so I wanna talk also now a little bit about the role of art in worship specifically. Um, and so art plays a really, really important role in the worship setting because it helps us do these things. So it helps us to grasp the world through our senses, our physical senses, okay? So seeing, hearing, smelling, feeling, um, you know, touch, for example, all of these are like sensual things that kind of really emphasize and aid uh, our ability to engage with the world, but also through worship as well. Uh, it helps us to experience and imagine God's presence both through and beyond physical creation. Um, and this image on this, uh, on the slide is a, a small drawing I did several years ago for my church 
um, for our Advent, and it's still actually up in the sanctuary of my church, and it's made with gold leaf and colored pencil, and I wanted to kind of illustrate and illuminate this notion of God's word creating a light in the darkness, and so this is the image I came up with, and so um, it's, it's in our sanctuary, and as people walk by it, they'll, they look at it, and it's just a reminder Right, and so this is a physical creation. It's an it's an image. It's on paper. There's a physicality to it, um, and in that that is that's a reminder of God's presence in our in our world. Um, it also uh, the role of art and worship also helps us to understand our humanity in relationship to God's goodness. And then it also draws our attention to the things God wants us to see. So those kind of small everyday details that I think as humans we tend to overlook. And sometimes forget. And so, you know, again, I think these four things are really, really key in regards to the role that art plays in our worship. Uh, it helps us to grasp the world through our physical senses, experience and imagine God's presence both through and beyond physical creation, understanding our humanity and relationships to God's goodness, um, again, which points back to the gospel, and then it draws attention to the things that God wants us to see. And so uh, we want to, you know, we want to keep these things in mind as we use our art within the worship setting. Uh, so I want to give you guys a little history now as well in regards to the arts in the church, because, you know, you could be like, wow, Joe, that sounds really great. That's okay, cool. How come we've never seen this before? Um, or maybe you're thinking, wow, I go to a, diff a church where we do this all the time. And so I think it's always good to point out that churches and, and Christians have been using the arts um, for even, you know, for as long, for the last 2000 years, for sure. But even predating that Jewish history is full of the arts. And so um, art has been used throughout Jewish and Christian uh, history uh, in the worship setting or in churches quite a bit. And so what you'll see is, especially when you look back historically, you'll see lots of images, lots of sculptures, the way that the churches are built and designed. Um, and those are all intentionally done to, again, communicate God's word. And historically, prior to, um, to really literacy and people, everyday kind of no normal people beginning to learn how to read, uh, images played a really important role in regards to helping people understand, again, the Bible and the, the, the biblical narrative um, and just really helping to illustrate script, scripture. And so this isn't anything new. Um, however, for 500 years ago, a little thing called the Protestant Reformation happened. And this is a little important because it really created what happened was it created a split in regards to how different churches and worship styles use images. Um, and so, again, I put the definition of the Protestant Reformation down on the bottom on the right. So in the 16th century, there was a split of the church along different theological beliefs and worship practices that marked the beginning of church structure as we know it today. And so it's a really influential uh, split that really um, plays a huge role into how we worship today. And I'm not going to go into all the details of the Reformation and all of that, because, um, again, that would be a whole other toolbox session. But it had a really, really impactful um, role in how art played in the worship practices or, or the way that the art was used in different worship practices. And so what happened is the Catholic and the Orthodox traditions, they continue to use art as a part of worship even up to today. And I have uh, many Catholic friends who, when I start to talk about this, they kind of roll their eyes and go like, yeah, duh, we know, like we've been born and we see this all the time. At the time, though, Protestant traditions really became skeptical of art, right? They feared it was being um, used in an, in a, as an idolatry. And tomorrow, Stephen Watson's going to talk a little bit about that. So I don't want to get too much into that today. Um, and so the Protestant churches really kind of pulled back and they scaled back on the amount of um, amount of images and statues and other kind of artistic things that you would see in the church. And so this impact was really felt on church Art, uh, architecture and church design, and just in terms of how the sanctuaries or kind of worship settings look. And so I wanted to show you, so here are some examples of um, some kind of famous examples of fine art that were in churches originally pre-Reformation. And so um, again, before the 1500s, you would go into churches and you would see lots of images and you would see imagery, again, pointing back to the kind of the biblical narrative. Um, and, and here are a couple other examples. Stained glass windows is a well-known one, as well as altarpieces that you see on the left. 
So again, the Catholic and Orthodox traditions, they never stopped engaging with the arts. And so when you walk into a Catholic church, so for example, this image is the interior view of the Cathedral of St. Paul, which is downtown um, in Birmingham. Uh, you're going to see this embracing of the visual arts and, and how the architecture incorporates um, both just the design, but also the arts into the worship setting and into the liturgy they do. And so when you walk into these spaces, you'll see lots of decorative arches, colorful stained glass, statues, mosaics, icons, paintings, and you can see this in this image. You can see the stained glass, you can see the statues on the wall, you can see the altar at the front. If you look up on the ceiling, the ceiling is decorated um, really, really beautifully, and you have again the high arches. And so these are, these are typically active spaces that are designed for participation, movement, prayer, and contemplation. And so in the Catholic tradition, you, you know, to, when you do communion, you would stand up and you would go to the front and you would take communion at the altar. And so there's a lot of movement throughout the service and throughout the liturgy. Um, and then the arts, again, reflect on that. People will go to the different parts and pray at different, at, in front of different uh, images or relics or things like that. It's just part of the liturgical kind of worship experience. Um, if you're from the Protestant evangelical traditions like I am, um, it's, it's a lot, it's a lot different. Uh, this is an interior view of Shades Mountain Baptist Church here in Birmingham. This is a church that's just up the hill from Sanford. Um, and you can see both when you compare the two side by side, the Catholic with the, with the evangelical Protestant tradition, you see very kind of different, some similar things, but very, very different kind of design. And so in the Protestant evangelical tradition, we really emphasize the word of God being preached from the pulpit. And so the pulpit or the center of the stage typically uh, is emphasized. You also, most of these churches will emphasize the cross of some kind. And so you can see in the image, the cross uh, kind of in that red, the area that's lit red. Uh, most uh, evangelical Protestant churches will have a cross at the front. And so again, they want the, the worshipers to really focus on that cross. And so they'll emphasize it through the seating, the way the auditorium is designed in terms of seating, but also the lighting as well. You can see, and again, this is a good example of that. Um, you'll find very little imagery. Some churches still have stained glass. Some have none. Um, it's nothing compared to like a Catholic or Orthodox church, for example, and you won't see any statues at all. Um, so you're not going to see those kind of artistic expressions in terms of like painting and sculpture uh, in a lot of these churches. Uh, his, I mean, today is still true somewhat today, but even historically. And so these are char, uh, churches that are designed to be really kind of passive uh, spaces where you're, you know, we're listening to the word, we're receiving God's word, and we're listening, and, and we're then praying and, and worshiping, but we're not up and around and moving throughout the, the, the sanctuary like you would do, for example, at a Catholic church. But the good news is, and this is kind of connects back to that information literacy thing that I was talking about earlier, is over the past 10, 15 years, there's been a real reemergence of the visual arts in Protestant and evangelical traditions. Um, and, and so this is really exciting, just, I mean, specifically for me. But since the early 2000s, the Protestant and evangelical churches have really become more open to engagement with visual art as part of the worship environment. And this is a, a big reason why this is, is because it's a response, again, to our culture's embrace of visual literacy and a real desire to reach non-believers through the arts. Art does this amazing thing where it will bring people together uh, in ways that oftentimes um, just, you know, coming to church or being coming to a church event might scare people off, but coming to a gallery at a church or coming to an art opening or coming to see some artistic thing, people are more open to. And so um, evangelical and Protestant churches have, have observed this. And so they started to actually really make huge efforts. Uh, and I've been really happy to see this, to reach out and to engage the artists that are amongst the congregation and to really get to understand um, what, how artists think and what, and what they do, because they're starting to realize just how impactful they can, they can be. And so where we've seen this expressed is through art galleries, um, live painting, maybe you've seen this where someone stands up and paints uh, in the background as the worship team plays or as the pastor uh, gives a sermon. Um, you'll see a lot of increased uses of uh, multimedia imagery on just in the slideshows uh, and, and even the worship setting itself well, it has kind of a new decorative, it's more decorative uh, in terms of images and things like that than maybe historically it had been. 
Uh, and so this is really encouraging to me uh, as an artist because uh, I feel like the church is finally reaching out and asking um, for me to also give my gifts and skills to participate in that worship setting in ways that, again, when I was a kid and when I was in high school in the, in the 1990s, um, my, my church in Iowa, just they didn't know what to do with me. Uh, and so here are some examples uh, of just different ways Protestant churches. So um, on the bottom left, again, you have the art gallery. And so churches are creating art galleries where the congregation can create images and, and put them up. Uh, different um, ways that just uh, sculpture, for example, the one on the, on the left up on the top, sculptures uh, are used just to kind of in that worship environment to bring a different element to it, again, to kind of heighten our senses and awareness of things. And then uh, you see, this is an example from Hillsong uh, on the right, but you see how the, the graphic behind the, the worship band is being used in a way, both in terms of just artistically and in design, but then also in terms of just video and multimedia production to help aid in that kind of overall worship experience. And so again, just really good news that, that a lot of Protestant and evangelical churches are really actively looking for ways to engage artists in their congregation. And this has not been something that they've done historically. And so here's how you can help with that um, with your own, within your own church and congregational body is, you know, first of all, if you have an interest in this, work with your church leadership, your youth leaders, your pastors, um, talk to your elders or deacons um, and say, hey, I have these gifts and I want to find a way to use them. And, and again, uh, we're living in an age when that, that is understood and there's a real uh, yearning for churches to use the arts. And so uh, be, you know, don't be afraid to ask that. And so uh, work with those church leaders to find ways where you can prayerfully incorporate your artistic skills into the worship setting. Um, again, I think prayer is always important uh, when, when doing that. And so you can really, you know, pay attention to what God is wanting you to do in that environment. Uh, look for other artists in your uh, congregation to help you. There might be other artists who want to help and have just been looking for a reason to get involved. And so if you know any, reach out to them or invite some of your friends. Uh, even if they're not artistic, most people are, you know, get excited to do, to, you know, to paint or do other things like that. And so invite them to help you so you don't have to do it alone. Uh, definitely want to make sure you keep your work theologically sound and appropriate. And this is why, again, working with your church leadership can be really helpful. Uh, so not only theologically sound in terms of it's, you know, it's, it's hearing to scripture and teachings of scripture, uh, but that's appropriate, that it's appropriate for the space, it's appropriate for the setting or the theme um, or what the leadership is trying to do. And so it's, a, it's about having a conversation with them, uh, asking lots of questions, getting their feedback, um, asking more questions, right? And just making sure that it's sound and uh, theologically sound and appropriate. And then finally, again, you wanna ensure that your work is glorifying God, that it's bringing not attention to you, but it's bringing attention to God. And that's what, again, the whole point is, is that we're making work because we want it to really not only glorify God, but lead others into worship of him. And so making sure that your work is appropriate for that. Uh, this is a view of a church that a friend of mine works at in Louisville, Kentucky called Sojourn um, Church Midtown. And in their, uh, in their sanctuary, they have these little spots next to the windows and they invite artists each month to put stuff into those spots. And so every month there's something new, some cool design or sculpture or, um, or painting or something that is meant to be in those spaces. And again, it goes, usually the work goes along with the theme that the pastor is preaching on. And so there's this really nice kind of way for the congregation to hear the word, but then they can look around and see and contemplate on the imagery that's around them during, during the service. Okay, so it's time for another two minute pause. And so I want you guys to take two minutes and to reflect uh, which tradition does your church mostly align? Catholic, Protestant, uh, Evangelical, Orthodox? Um, and then engage. So take a moment and kind of imagine, picture your home sanctuary. What does that look like? Make a list of the visual elements present. Um, and then how do you, those elements help you grow closer to God? So two minutes, I'll start now. Which tradition does your church mostly align? And then again, picture your home sanctuary. What does it look like? And make a list of the elements that you can remember. Uh, that are present and how do those elements help you to grow closer to God.
All right, about 30 more seconds. All right. Um, take a moment and just pray with me real quick. Uh, dear God, we thank you for the work you are doing in my home church and for creating different worship traditions for your people to belong. Despite our differences, I am grateful for my brothers and sisters from those different traditions. Help us remain unified in your spirit for your glory. Amen. Okay, so this leads to another question that um, what is something that I really struggled with as a teenager. And again, when I was in college, and that is, can art that doesn't illustrate biblical scenes still glorify God and lead others in worship? And the simple answer is yes, right? Uh, remember, God works through all things for his glory. And so that's Romans 8, 28. And so um, even though you might not understand or see God working through that, um, you know, we trust that God, again, being all knowing that he is, that God has has, is going to use that in some way that you might not even realize. Um, artists also use analogy, they use metaphor, and they use other methods to, to communicate biblical themes and ideas beyond just kind of straight illustrations of, you know, biblical characters or biblical scenes. And oftentimes, um, especially because for many of us who are Christians and have been Christians for a long time, those things are so common that we're just kind of used to seeing it and it might not have as big of an impact. Whereas an analogy or a metaphor or something like that. And I think of like Jesus using and teaching with parables, right? Like Jesus is teaching with parables because it helps to illustrate a bigger theme or idea in a way that is familiar to the people who are hearing them um, and, and can be a really powerful way to help them understand what, he's, what he was trying to say. And so uh, I would encourage you to use analogies, metaphors, other, other kind of methods uh, to communicate those things. And so the other thing I think is important to remember is that visual art and design often needs time and space for contemplation. Um, you, you have to give people time to engage and interact with the work in order to really uh, let the Holy Spirit um, work with them. And so don't be afraid to give your viewer space to allow the Holy Spirit to work. Uh, and so what I want to do is take a moment and just show you guys three different artists who are doing uh, some really cool stuff. The first is a guy named Stephen Krauts. Uh, he's a South Carolina-based artist and illustrator. If you're familiar at all with Andrew Peterson, uh, the, mu the musician, um, he was at Animate, I think, two years ago. Um, he, he, Stephen does all of the illustrative, like, uh, album designs and things like that for Andrew Peterson. And so I'm sure if you've seen Andrew's work, you've seen his work as well. Uh, and so Stephen's work explores aspects of the true, the good, and the beautiful. And so he's designed several album and book covers and his work, like I said, is featured uh, in a lot of Andrew Peterson stuff, including on stage. And so for example, when Andrew Peterson goes on tour and he does his concerts, um, Stephen's uh, illustrations are, are projected in the background. And I've had the, you know, the privilege to see a couple of these different shows uh, live and they really do add a whole other element uh, to the music that's being played in a really cool way. And then here are a couple examples of uh, Stephen's work um, in terms of book and, and poster design and things like that. Uh, another artist is a friend of mine, his name is Steve Prince. Uh, Steve is a Virginia-based artist. He refers to himself as an art evangelist, and he uses his work to really go around both in churches, but also in secular environments, uh, institutions, universities, things like that. Uh, and he talks about the gospel really in a really bold, bold way. And so he uses his work to explore human experience and large-scale works, uh, both in charcoal and printmaking. And so he's African-American, and so he, he depicts African-American history and culture, and he encapsulates those uh, and, and kind of merges that with biblical themes and symbols, um, such as lament, sorrow, salt, and light, things like this. This image uh, here is called Salt of the Earth. This is a uh, drawing, like a uh, print that that's uses a lot of drawing uh, that he did several years ago. And so this is of uh, the civil rights leaders who were at the lunch counter in North Carolina 
and so he depicts them but then on the table he, he has these kind of symbols of like the dove and the cross and things like that and so he's kind of merging this african-american history and spirituality with uh themes and scripture from the bible and he does a lot of really cool stuff with printmaking um and so if you see any kind of work that looks like this this is de this is definitely kind of his his style um, and again, and so he's bringing, he's merging these elements of African American history and culture together with, um, with scripture. And then uh, finally, another artist I wanted to introduce you to is a friend of mine. Her name is Mandy Cano Villaluevos. Uh, she's based in Michigan, and she works in an interdisciplinary way. And so she does uh, drawing and painting. She does sculpture. She also does uh, what are called performance art or performance pieces where she'll do, it's very theatrical and she'll, she'll do a performance um, and it'll, it'll only, she'll record it so people can watch it later, but the actual act itself only happens one time. And so her work explores themes of history, the passage of time, the nature of memory. Um, she's a mother, so she also talks a lot about motherhood and relates that to this kind of biblical sense of what that means. Um, and so she uses different materials symbolically to depict our human frailty, uh, she does a lot of meditative repetition uh, as she's praying, um, and then also it involves a lot of physical labor. And so uh, here are some, some examples of some of her sculpture and a couple of her drawings. And then this is, again, one of her performance pieces that she recorded where she took a toothbrush and she um, cleaned the floor with a toothbrush. And so this is kind of physical, very highly physical thing um, in this notion that uh, she's trying to, again, clean some specific spaces that are taking a long period of time. Um, she didn't clean the whole floor. She only cleaned that little bit of it, and then, and then she documents and records it. Um, and so, again, these are, these are metaphors. They're analogies for other things. Um, okay, as we wrap up, um, I wanted to summarize real quickly just, again, what we talked about and learned today. Uh, again, we live in a, visual, a visually literate culture. And so people are very comfortable with images and they're comfortable decoding images. And so I want that to encourage you and, and, you know, again, encourage you guys to be bold in the images that you're making and not to be timid and worry about that someone's not going to understand or get it. Um, people will, you might need to give them a little bit of time, but, but again, we're much, much more sophisticated than we even realize in, in terms of our ability to do that. Uh, second of all, we're called, by, called to use our artistry as co-creators to accomplish God's work in the world. Um, again, art is a calling and the skills that we've been given are given to us by God. And so, you know, we're called by God to use that uh, to accomplish his work. Art plays important roles in worship. And so keep that in mind as well. Uh, most churches want to use the visual arts. And again, I hope that encourages you. And just I want to invite you guys to find ways within your home congregation where you can use the visual arts in the worship setting um, and to help each other to do that well. And then finally, God can use your artistry to glorify him. And so don't be afraid to make stuff. Don't be afraid to paint. Don't be afraid to draw. Don't be afraid to take pictures, do design, um, design you know, buildings, interior design, all of that stuff. Um, God wants you to use those skills because ultimately it brings him glory, right? It brings him satisfaction as his created beings, as his children, and it brings him glory. And so don't be afraid to use those things, uh, to use those skills, excuse me, to make, to make things and to, and to do stuff. And, and again, I think a lot of times, and I, when I was in high school, I was always really self-conscious, like, oh, you know, I don't know, I wanna be an artist, but I feel like the world doesn't understand me, and what does that mean? Um, you know, God gets it, and he's given you those skills and abilities. And, and so, you know, I just wanna encourage you guys to, to, to use those and to not be afraid to make stuff. Okay, and then our final two minute pause, um, using your artistry for God's purpose. And so let's, let's take a moment and reflect. So before today, what did you think was the purpose of art? How has today's toolbox changed your view? Uh, or has your today's toolbox changed your view? If so, how? And so, you know, take a moment and think about that and how has it changed your view? And then, um, what I want to do is invite you to use your artistic talent to contribute something to this year's festival of worship. So write down a few quick ideas for what you can do. And so take a couple of moments and just brainstorm like off the top of your head, like, Oh, what could I do? Um, you know, what imagery comes to mind or what kind of drawings could I make or something like that. And so think about different ways that you can use your passion for art in your congregation as well. So let's take, let's take two minutes. Uh, and again, we'll start the time now and just spend some time reflecting, 
in terms of what you learned today about arts purposed and how your view may have changed. And then again, how you can use those artistic talents um, to, to help, uh, to not only you know, help your church, but also to, to contribute to our festival of worship this year. All right, take about 15 seconds. Okay, and again, pray with me. Um, dear God, thank you for giving me a passion and curiosity for art and for the artists we looked at today. Show me how I can use my skills and talent to glorify you. Amen. Okay, again, before we go, I wanted to invite you guys to contribute to our gallery of joy. And so in response to this toolbox um, session and just the visual arts track, which you're gonna learn tomorrow and also on Wednesday, um, is we invite you to create a work of art to share in our online gallery of joy. And so again, you can use whatever art supplies you have around your house or your smartphone. Um, you just need to make something by July 1st and you can find the instructions for uploading it onto the, on the Animate uh, Flex 21 Attendify page. And so look there and then you can upload your image. And this year's theme is rejoice. And so, you know, think about something that, that might fall in line with that theme of rejoice. And I can't wait to see what you guys uh, work. So here are some helpful resources. Again, because this is being recorded, you guys can uh, find this later or your leaders, if they're interested in learning more about this, here are some really helpful uh, resources for uh, just learning about how the arts can be used in the church. And so I definitely encourage uh, you guys, but also your leaders to check these out as well. And then finally, just thank you guys for attending. Uh, if you have any questions, um, feel free to stick them in the chat. Uh, I'm happy to stick around for a few more minutes or if you think of something later, let's connect. You can always send me an email. My email address is jcory at sanford.edu. So thank you all again for coming. I know you've had a really busy day uh, and I just I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Yes. Thanks, Joe, for a very informative, engaging look at using our creativity to God's glory. So well said. I, so theologically rich and yet practical, Joe. And um, I just want to thank you for your uh, faithfulness to God's call and for your willingness to share with us. Um, really do appreciate that and um, appreciate your time and preparing this. And um, it's so rich, as, as Joe mentioned, this has been recorded. And so it will be uploaded back to Attendify as a video. So if at any point you wanted to go back and review uh, any of the information, it will be available online through the end of the summer. And I do hope you all will participate in the Gallery of Joy. Um, it will be available. You can upload things until July 1st. Um, if we uh, will have some time set aside on Thursday for you to work some more on your um, Gallery of Joy entries. So that the day is not as full of classes on Thursday. So you'll have time on your own to work on that. And anything that's uploaded by seven o'clock on the evening of Thursday of this week will be in the grand opening of the Gallery of Joy, which will release uh, a week from Thursday, so next week. But you can you can um, provide your entries um, 
past that point if it takes you, it takes time to create these works and we understand that so if it takes you a little longer that's fine as well uh, thanks to all of you for participating um, one quick reminder and then we'll let you take a break from the screens and from this class from classes for a little bit um, we'll have toolbox electives coming up starting at four o'clock there will be one live elective class today, and that will be um, with Dr. Jason Terry, who will teach kind of a piano improv class. So if that's something that interests you, you might want to jump on that Zoom link at four o'clock. And it will, of course, be um, helpful if you have a piano or keyboard close by, although I, I'm sure he'll make it engaging enough that you could learn something if you don't have access to a piano. That's that's OK, too. So if you're interested in that, that is the one live elective class that's available today. The other electives are available as video on demand and the same group of videos will be available throughout the week. So you can either choose one today or if you want to do the live um, class today and do a video tomorrow, you can do that as well. Whatever fits best with your interests and your schedule. So with that, I will uh, say thank you and sign off here for now. And we'll see those of you who are interested in the live class um, on the Zoom link for Dr. Terry's toolbox. And the rest of you, we will see tomorrow um, as we regroup for Welcome and Worship 101 at 10 in the morning. So have a great afternoon and we'll see you soon. <laughs>